animal and fungus are closer related to animals than to plants. The plants and animals did a break many, many years ago and fungus did a break over on this side with us a very long time ago, okay? So they can't manufacture their own food like plants can. They are multi-celled. Their cells do not bunch together like a plant cell or a human cell. They actually go in a string, a long line, one after the other, and those are called hyphae. So hyphae is like a long strand, and you'd see like a cell wall here, cell wall here. And in each cell, there's a nucleus, and they have all kinds of good stuff on the inside, just like any other cell. But Unlike other cells in the animal kingdom, they are in a long straight line, head to toe, okay? Um, they can be saprophytic or parasitic. Saprophytic means it breaks down material. So it eats dead things, things that are already dead or, I guess, not attached to the plant, or I guess not living. So saprophytes would be about 98% of fungi we find are going to be saprophytes. These are going to be fungi that are in the environment, and all they do is wait for the right material to come across them so that they can um, <clears throat> excrete enzymes and break it down and consume it. Okay? And not until that specific molecule comes across does it really react to anything. Or you can have parasitic. That's going to be a fungus is going to be something that lives on or with in conjunction with something else and uses that other something else as a food source. Also as protection and for structure. Mycelium, hyphae, and spores. Okay. Mycelium is this. It's a whole ball or a, a glob of hyphae. And then, of course, you have the hyphae, which is one single strand. And then you have spores. What are spores? It's the reproductive organs of the fungus. Okay? So this is how it spreads, is through, through spores. It basically will spread through wind or through water splashing or in some way some abiotic factor will take that spore and move it somewhere else okay so fungus depend on abiotic factors in order to reproduce they excrete enzymes and absorb nutrients through a cell wall so if this hyphae was to say laying right next to a piece of leaf and this, hyph this fungus specifically broke down that kind of material. What it would do is excrete some enzymes to start breaking down that material. Once that <clears throat> material starts breaking down, the nutrients are then released from that material. It lays right up against it and it absorbs it through the cell wall. <clears throat> no mouth, no mouth, just absorbed. Like I said, spread through wind, water, soil, animals spread them, equipment. Use a bleach spray on your equipment every time you go onto the field and in plant material. Can make its own openings in a plant. It can actually lay on a plant surface, excrete an enzyme which punctures a hole in the leaf of or the stem of the plant and then enter the plant through that hole which it has created itself. 85% of plant diseases are fungus. So when we look at our diseases today, chances are 9, 9 out of 10 or 8 out of 10 of the group is going to be a fungus. So even if you were to guess which one it is, you might get it right. Okay? <clears throat> okay, characteristics of fungal infection. Here we go. This is probably the most important slide. Who's missing the most important slide? Characteristics of infection. Okay, you have damping off. Anybody know what damping off is? Okay, has anybody ever planted a seed 
in the soil or like a tray. And then the next day you come out and there's a, a seed emerged. And you're like, yay. And then you go back the next day and they're all laying sideways and they all fall over because and the stem kind of turned to mush. Okay, that's called damping off. That's actually a fungus that spreads through wind and it usually affects just seedlings. So um, you want to be careful when you, how much moisture you have around your seedlings, uh, what environment your seedling is in. If it's outside, chances are it's going to get damped off. That's why people put seedlings in a greenhouse. Um, if it happens once, the plant's dead. That's it. It heals over. You can't recover from it. So um, it's also, you also got to watch your splashing when you water. And do not water right before the sun goes down. Water at least, no, not after 1 p.m. And then damping off won't be an issue. Okay? You have leaf spots, which can happen in bacteria as well, but usually going to be circular. Okay? If you see a circle spot, 99% of the time it's going to be a fungus. Um, is that thing still on? Okay. Mildew. Powdery mildew. Right? Looks like a white powder over the, the top of the, the leaf. Very, very common to see in greenhouses, in nurseries, and uh, close to the ground. And what is powdery mildew? Well, it's just a fungus that gets blown around. Um, it actually, it's very rare for a fungus to inhabit the surface of a plant. Usually it's on the underneath because there's a lot of waxy material on top. But this fungus is able to poke in through there. What it does is it creates little hyphae and pokes into the leaf all over it and can be pretty decimating to a plant. Um, if you find powdery mildew, watch your air movement. If you can increase your air movement, the powdery mildew will probably go away. So if you have in your garden a bunch of, um, uh, let's see, cucumbers, like uh, cucurbits, for the most part, are pretty susceptible to it. So if you got like squash or something or watermelon out there, and the leaves <coughs> can be completely covered uh, right overnight. And if you just kind of take the materials back and maybe weed around it and get some air flow in there, or if you're in a greenhouse and you turn on some fans and get some air flowing, that probably the powdery mildew will go away. If you don't, um, sulfur works great on it. Cankers. Cankers are, you ever see the side of a tree where it's got like kind of like a, you can see the inside structure. The bark is kind of peeled back and kind of rolled back. And that's a canker. It's kind of like if you get, humans get cankers in their mouth, right? And it's kind of like an exposed hole. So um, they cause that fungus is a uh, cause cankers, and it also does root rot as well. So that's pretty bad for sweet potato farmers, ginger farmers, and that kind of thing. Bacteria. What is bacteria? Second most important slide of the day. They're going to be single-celled, right? One-celled organisms. Um, they mutate readily, which is why they're able to succeed so well. Um, they're constantly reproducing. They're constantly making clones of themselves. And when you start um, exchanging chromosomes, exchanging chromosomes, it's bound to be a mutation at some point. And this is how bacteria is able to really have such a foothold on our world, is that it evolves even in this tiny little micro environment on the side of a plant will evolve to exist to its fullest potential in that environment. They're, they are saprophytes and parasites, just like fungus. They can affect all plant parts, the roots, the stems, the seeds, the fruits, everything. And they must enter through an opening. Okay, If you rip your leaf, or if you do any kind of pruning, um, you're, you're opening up your, your, the, the exoskeleton, if you will, the bark <clears throat> of the plant to be exposed to bacteria. So if you're ever going to wound your plant for any reason, you have to take the proper steps to make sure the bacteria does not infest that plant after you're done. So if you do something like pruning, citrus tree, make a cut, and you get some latex paint up on there and cover that hole up. 
white paint right over the top of the hole. We'll prevent bacteria from getting in there. Back in the day, you used to use tar and stuff, right? They don't use that anymore. You just use white latex paint. Works great. Um, has to enter through an opening, can't make its own hole. That's the difference between bacteria and fungi, or one of them. It's spread in soil solution or on plant material. Soil solution is what? The water in the soil. So it's very water dependent. Bacteria can travel wherever it wants to go if it has water. And remember, I told you that everything has a water layer surface. So it can pretty much get anywhere. Um, it can, especially in the soil. Very mobile. And remember, they, uh, if you've seen back in science class, they have the flagella. And they, they have like little sperm tails, right? Some of them are corkscrews and some of them just squiggle. They're able to travel through that water pretty fast. Um, and when you have a trillion of them going in one direction, it's, it, it can be pretty detrimental to your plant. And they degrade cell walls, which is important in identification. Characteristics of infection. OK. Super important. Intercellular movement. Oh, man, you missed the two slides. Intercellular movement. Where in fungus, we saw in fungus, notice that the fungus, this one right here, kind of is able to lay on top of the veins. The vein runs this way, and there's a vein here. And it kind of can just stay on the vein. It can stay on you know, the, the, the leaf cells on the side. It's pretty indiscriminate on where it can inhabit. Okay. Bacteria usually get stopped by the veins because it's intercellular. So it's on the inside of the cell. It's not usually on the top of the cells like fungus would be. It's actually inside the plant structure. So veins usually limit the development of an infected region. These are circular, kind of like the other ones, right? Like the fungus. I said, look for circular. Well, if you saw that and that's all you did, you'd be like, oh, looks like a fungus. But then again, you don't see any of the black spots crossing over veins, do you? None of them are going over those different structures. So the veins of a leaf are going to be a much stronger cell structure. It's going to be higher lignin content. And so bacteria actually can't break through that lignin. It has to travel along the soft cells of the leaf. OK? This is how you identify bacteria. Is it a black, almost water-soaked look spot that doesn't cross over the leaf's uh, vein surface. A little bit more difficult when you're talking about stems and roots, but to identify at least a leaf bacteria. Water-soaked look, very, very common. Looks like you took your lettuce and just kind of left it in a bowl of water, right? And then you pull it out, it's all soggy and nasty. That's basically what bacteria causes. And you could also identify it through bacterial streaming. What that is, is say I have a leaf that has bacteria in it, and I take scissors and I cut right through that bacterial infection and, and that little spot, and I hold that leaf into some water. And as I'm looking through the container, I'm looking at the water, um, there will be an ooze that comes out of that hole. And it's, it looks like a snot. And you hold it over and you can see it streaming out. And what that is, is the bacteria um, is freaking out and turning mobile because you, you severed the cells. So it's essentially gravity and, and the, the pull of the water. Um, remember I told you about how water bonds with itself really well? What it does is actually the water that you have it in starts pulling the water out of the leaf. And that makes that snout. And you can actually identify a bacterial infection from that. Okay? So. Over the veins, fungus, circular, and then not in the veins, leaf soaked, water soaked, black spots bacteria, right? <clears throat> spots, spots, more spots. Comparison of fungal and bacterial leaf spots. 
Well, you look at your symptom description first. Is it water soaked in appearance? Like I said, probably bacterial. Does it have a texture? Is it rough? Well, if it does, if it's dry and papery, it's probably fungus. But if it's slimy, then it's probably a bacteria. Does it have a smell? Bacteria will always have a, almost a fermented smell. Pattern? Circular, target-like, irregular and angular for bacteria. Look for those circular spots and look to see if it's crossing over veins. You've already identified it. Disintegration. Uh, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means. Disintegration. Does it break apart? I don't know. Uh, Color change. Very important, <clears throat> a red, almost always yellow, and sometimes purple halos around that spot. So if you have a spot, usually sometimes the fungus is bad enough, it makes a hole through it. And then you have a yellowing area on the outside. Good indication of a fungus. Structures of the pathogen. Of course, we put, look it under the microscope. We're going to see mycelia, spores, and fruiting structures. And bacteria are so small, you're not going to see them. So if you look under a microscope and you see something, chances are it's fungus. If you don't see anything, it just looks like water-soaked leaf, and you can't see anything, then it's probably bacteria. Okay? Viruses, not all that important, really. I mean, cause mainly because there's nothing you do about it. <laughs> what it comes down to is if you have a virus infection in your plant, you probably have to chop your plant down. You probably have to replace your soil or do something to get the virus out of the environment. To save time, these are some descriptions. Read through them real quick, and I'm going to keep going. Viruses, not that big a deal unless you're talking about um, spotted virus, like the papaya virus and the mosaic virus and those types of things. Um, at that point, like I said, you either get involved with the extension agent or just you're going to have to chop your plant down. So, characteristics of viral, you have molting, of course you have spots, mosaic-like pattern, that's mosaic, right? So it looks like kind of like you took paint and just <laughs> splattered it, almost like, um, what's that painter called? Pollock. Pollock, right. Looks like a Pollock painting. So there's also crinkling, malformations, and plant stunting. Don't forget about parasitic plants, they do exist, they will grab onto your crop. They will stick their little straws into the stems and start sucking out that juice that you've spent so much money and fertilizer on. So you gotta really be careful. They don't produce their own chlorophyll, so they have to get an energy source from somewhere else. Um, most of the time they don't have roots. Water, minerals, and sugars are consumed from the host plant and it causes wilting, stunting, chlorotic, and witch's broom. Uh, witch's broom is basically, if you imagine a broom turned upside down. So you'll have like a tree and only the top of it has growth, the new growth, and then it's just kind of naked all the way down. So that's, that's common for parasitic plants. Of course, we have nematodes. They are microscopic flatworm. They uh, live in soil, water, and on plant materials, and they have a stylet. Um, which is essentially a needle that they have in their mouth. And they will actually go up to a plant and stick that needle in and start sucking out juices. Root knot nematode is one of the biggest problems. Let's check this video I got here. You guys getting bored yet? <laughs> Let's see here. Okay. All right. Already at this early stage, you hear that? the root is well developed. 
This diagram shows you. So those are dead nematodes that are filled with eggs. They wait for conditions to be perfect. They could be down there 30 years waiting. That music With is great. Stylet, the nematode punctures the rigid wall of this initial feeding cell. However, the cell's delicate plasma membrane is carefully inactivated. Now, out of the opening of its stylet, the nematode releases a variety of secretions into the host cell. These secretions affect, among other targets, the cell nucleus. So it changes a perfectly good cell into its own food source. So that's how they go in. They'll bust through. I get inside the cells, and if you see this, those cells started to break down, they just rapidly keep breaking down to the point where the whole root is, is dead. So this is, a, um, this is, this is a, a nematode that will basically um, create <coughs> a food source based upon living cells. Um, root knot nematode is a little bit different. It really um, it stays within the root and doesn't try to kill the root. It actually just tries to make an environment that the plant can exist, it can exist, but the only problem is it doesn't make it a marketable crop. So your beets come all lumpy and weird and they all have tumors on them, but in fact, the beet really isn't, isn't a bad beet. Um, it's just you can't market it, you can't really sell those. That's why root knot nematode is, is really such a big problem. Um, yeah, um, sun hemp cover crop, you do that for about four or five cycles. Um, and you, you, pr you can pretty much eradicate them. Fumigation, all these other things that you could do. Um, OK, nematodes? All that information available to CTAR? Yes, you can go on CTAR website and look up root knot nematode, and they have tons and tons of write-ups on them and how to prevent, and if you have them, and how to get them identified and all that stuff. Okay, prevention and control. Um, what are we talking about here? Nematodes, parasitic plants? Cultural management, plant selection. Ah, this is in general, I guess. 
Prevention and control. Um, you want to make sure that you have the right plant selection, proper environment for healthy growth, proper soil management, prevent compaction. Uh, compaction creates anaerobic conditions, which, like I said, causes a lot of bacteria. Um, only apply fertilizers to, to the, what the plant needs. Don't just broadcast fertilizers, because you could be giving nutrients to things you don't want to give nutrients to, like weeds or nematodes. Increase water holding capacity of your soil. Mechanical control, you can do tillage. You can clean out, infest, you want to clean out your infested materials, rotate crops, we went through this, mulch and solarization. Biological controls, um, using composts, IMOs or beneficial insects. Avoid blanket applications, only spot treat instead, which is very, very important for keeping your environmental damage down. Chemical controls, be sure you have the right identification of your insect or pathogen or weed before you use any chemicals. Um, appropriate selection of the materials is important. Please follow the label to a T and using recommended methods of application I would actually recommend using less than what they recommend and see if that works. And if that does, you can save money and do less damage to the environment. Um, using recommended methods for application, make sure that you're doing it at the right time of day. You're not doing it in wind and watch your drift. Uh, and always spot treat. Don't just blanket out your whole field. Abiotic disorders. Okay, light. The sun can cause problems for quality. Oh, I'm sorry, when we're talking about light, there is two things we want to discuss. One is quality and one is intensity. Quality is what? It's actually the color um, that, you're, that the plants are getting on the spectrum. So remember, if you remember your spectrum, a rainbow goes from what reds and yellows all the way up to greens and blues. So um, during different phases of development, a plant needs different spectrum of light. So light quality can be a problem. If you're not getting the right spectrum of light for the right de developmental phase of your plant, then you can certainly have an abiotic issue. Um, the intensity of the sunlight, if you, you know, if it's pretty high solarization, there's no shade and your, your crop is going to just kind of dry out in the sun, that is certainly an abiotic factor. Um, day length, that's not really an issue here in Hawaii, but on the mainland it is. Uh, cover, can you cover, put a cover over your, uh, your crops and then watch out for canopy control, which is um, dictating how much light gets down to the surface. You can do this by using trees or um, some kind of canopy over your crop if you want to do that. If you want to reduce the amount of light that hits your soil, plant something that's taller than your crop. Temperature. Most plants function in a very narrow range of temperature. So if plants get below 70 degrees, mostly in Hawaii, most plants will die. So um, watch your temperature and see if you can reduce your temperature if you're getting way too high of a temperature. Air temp versus soil temp are two different things. Air temperature really doesn't affect plants all that much as compared to soil temperature. So where <clears throat> if the temperature of the soil goes up one degree, it's like the air temperature going up 10 degrees. So if you're getting a lot of solarization and the sun's baking your soil and it's bringing it up to 100 degrees, that's certainly something you want to address, mulch. Okay. Heat stress, way too much heat for too long, plants will certainly wilt and die. Um, vernalization, bolting, it's basically when a plant gets too hot, it starts freaking out and saying, I'm going to die, so I need to reproduce right now. And so like with lettuce, th this will happen. If you have a lettuce plant and all of a sudden you see it overnight just going shooting up and going to seed, it's probably because your soil temperature is too high and it's freaking out. So watch your soil temperature and do a little mulching. Cover, gro uh, cover your growing area. Um, ventil ventilation. So if you're in a greenhouse and temperature is an issue, ventilate. Or if you can somehow figure out a way to open up your field. Maybe you have 
um, some 5E trees around your property that is preventing airflow and your soil temperature.